the rising cost and burden of mental illness is a significant concern for everyone, especially the federal government and the states. Medicaid is the largest payer for mental health services in the U.S. Our next speaker, Kitty Purrington, uh, will share an update on state approaches to improving behavioral health care. Kitty is a senior program director at the National Academy for State Health Policy. She has over 20 years of experience working on state Medicaid policies to support behavioral health needs, including overseeing the development of the Medicaid Behavioral Health Home Model for Adults and Children in Maine. Kitty? Great, thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate participating in this discussion. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the state policy role in improving mental health services and um, kind of the unique role that states have in this area. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the key challenges facing states and also talk about the um, specific policy levers that we're seeing states use to address um, just a, a, a scope of challenges in delivering uh, or supporting effective systems and services for people with um, behavioral health needs. So um, first, I wanted to just review very briefly why states really care about mental health and are very invested in these issues. Um, first, states, uh, uh, as Catherine mentioned, incorporating Medicaid spending are really significant payers in the world of behavioral health services and supports. And <clears throat> in fact, Medicaid is the single largest payer for mental health um, services in the U.S. And state, state systems um, developed uh, a traditional role of providing care to people with serious mental illness. Um, from the 19th century on, they were really uh, seen as uh, essential um, uh, elements of the system of care for people with serious mental illness in terms of supporting the asylums and institutions of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, following the deinstitutionalization of um, individuals with serious mental illness in the 70s and 80s, um, this view of the state function, of states being core to supporting individuals with um, mental illness is still very much alive in the policy world, and in some unfortunate ways, as evidenced by what is known as the IMD exclusion or the unappealingly named Institutes for Mental Disease Policy, um, so this policy um, prevents state Medicaid agencies from not being able to use federal funding to pay for treatment within state mental health institutions um, as opposed to other, other settings, other inpatient settings. Um, and uh, this policy of states really being the primary locus uh, for mental health care is also very much reinforced in the distinctions in benefits and approaches between Medicaid and Medicare, which um, Medicare until recently paid only 50% of claims for mental health treatment and still, for, for a number of reasons, still offers a, a much more limited benefit package for people um, who have mental health needs. So states are increasingly recognizing that mental health is a cost multiplier for their programs. And the data, is, the data is very clear that having a mental health diagnosis increases the cost of care, um, largely for physical health diagnoses, um, enormously. Medicaid spending for behavioral health diagnoses is roughly four times higher for spending than those without these disorders. And um, people with mental health diagnoses are much more likely to have multiple chronic conditions, use more services such as emergency room and inpatient services, and more likely to have readmissions. Um, it, it, generally, having a mental health issue coupled with many of the systemic challenges that people with mental health face really makes it a lot harder to do a lot of things. It, it tends to make people poor. Um, it also um, often comes with medication regimens that make people prone to metabolic diseases like diabetes. So all of these factors have a very significant impact on the mortality rates of people with mental illness, serious mental illness in particular, who die on average 15 to 20 years before their peers without these disorders.
when we talk about state mental health systems or state mental health policies, we, we are really talking about two quite different systems of care. Uh, there's a lot of overlap, um, but they tend to be, from a state policy perspective, um, fairly distinct for a number of reasons with different payment policies and different approaches at the state level. So on the one hand, um, in the uh, first column, I have what I'm calling here general mental health services, for lack of a better term, which describes the capacity really for primary care providers to deliver behavioral health treatments for um, a range of conditions that can be successfully identified and treated in more integrated settings. So this approach to mental health treatment does not necessarily, it's, it doesn't necessarily align neatly with diagnoses, but it can include things like, as we've heard, um, depression, um, attention deficit disorder, anxiety, and other, um, and other disorders um, that with some support can and really should be addressed early and effectively within settings like federally qualified health centers or school-based health clinics and um, general primary care. But there are surprisingly a number of barriers to supporting treatment in these settings, and um, states over the past five to ten years have really been keenly interested in promoting the development of more integrated models for Medicaid populations um, who are more likely than um, other beneficiaries, commercial beneficiaries, for instance, in, to be dealing with a behavioral health diagnosis. And um, state policymakers have really been engaged in identifying policy levers to help build that integrated capacity in, in primary care, including support for assessment and screening, <clears throat> and the ability to have multidisciplinary teams that can include care coordination and oftentimes a behavioral health specialist. Sometimes that um, behavioral health specialist can be co-located when feasible, um, but also uh, looking beyond the walls of a primary care setting and um, building supports for how primary care practices can really effectively link with and refer to more specialized care when needed. Also, um, states have been doing uh, quite a bit of investment in pushing out integrated data, Medicaid data, and looking at other ways that technology can support practices to have a better connection to um, behavioral health services and supports, but also a better perspective, a more comprehensive perspective of uh, an individual patient's needs that's um, getting uh, treatment from their, from their practice. Um, somewhat in contrast, um, people with serious mental illness, very generally speaking, typically receive mental health treatment through a specialty, through specialty service providers that rely very, very heavily on Medicaid and on state um, funding. Um, these, these systems are really creatures of state Medicaid and state um, funding. Um, and, and as such, states are very uh, involved in defining the service array, defining medical necessity or eligibility criteria for these services, which often includes uh, a diagnosis plus some sort of additional functional criteria um, that indicates a more intensive need for services. And the services provided by the specialty mental health system are going to be a broader range of services, more intensive services that typically or generally speaking are not going to be found certainly in Medicare or in commercial insurance pa packages such as peer supports. Um, supported employment, supported housing, and other things that can assist people to recover and live effectively in the community. Um, because this is, this is really a broad area of concern for states, and there are a number of policy issues that states are very involved in, um, there are things that present persistent challenges as well as some things that are more emerging, um, particularly uh, in relation to the um, opioid epidemic and um, SUD challenges generally. Um, for states work in promoting integrated care for their um, Medicaid populations, promoting and sustaining services across primary settings and especially safety net settings is really an ongoing priority and an ongoing challenge. Understanding what primary care and related settings really need to address mental health diagnoses, how these services can be supported effectively and incentivized, 
um, has been uh, the focus of a lot of work by state policymakers over the past few years. As mentioned previously, the behavioral health workforce is also a huge concern, and I think in integrated care is often looked at as a way to leverage the workforce more effectively so that um, state systems can increase access to behavioral health. Um, but it's particularly challenging to support a diverse workforce and um, a behavioral health workforce that can address the particular needs of older adults, uh, children, and also um, the needs of people who live in rural areas. <coughs> um, on, uh, within state sort of more specialized mental health systems, states are really realizing that mental health systems which are fundamental to overall health need to be able to participate in state health reforms and payment reforms. And in, in many states, mental health systems have been um, the purview of smaller providers who operate on very narrow fiscal margins and as such um, are very challenged to participate in payment models involving risk, for instance, or they may not have the data capacity that large medical systems are able to purchase to um, support their practices. Um, so there is a, there's a lot of investment to be made um, within these systems to support evidence-based or best practices, to support the use of data and health information technology, and um, kind of the overall capacity to participate in value-based purchasing and state health reforms. Um, there are um, certainly organizations that are large and sophisticated and are, are doing this work are participating in these kinds of state health reforms and have um, a lot of this capacity, but there are probably more that are not there yet. Um, in addition to these emerging issues, states have a long-standing interest in supporting a continuum of care for individuals with serious mental illness that can help avert crises, that can maintain housing, that can avoid corrections involvement, and other outcomes, other adverse outcomes that can result when people with these um, often very significant challenges are not able to access care in a way that is timely and um, appropriate. So it's an ongoing challenge for state policymakers exacerbated by things like the IMD exclusion mentioned earlier and um, uh, the challenge of managing state budgets and limited resources. So also uh, across both a general and specialty mental health systems, states are really grappling with the so-called diseases of despair and how to balance these scarce resources and at the same time invest a lot of increasing amounts of federal funding in ways that can sustain capacity. So um, we do see states looking at the foundations that they have built through integrated care as a way to support things like medication-assisted treatment um, to do that more effectively and also looking at ways that both general and specialty systems can do a better job of recognizing and understanding how social determinants come into play here. So my last two slides provide a brief overview of the varied policy levers. These are kind of the key policy levers that states have to address some of these challenges starting with support for integrated care that is happening in primary care practices and FQHCs and places like that. And for, obviously, as we've discussed previously for a long time, the prevailing thought was that states should keep mental health and physical health benefits at the Medicaid, the state level separate, with the thinking that in a capitated MCO environment, mental health treatment would receive a short shrift. Um, that pendulum is definitely swinging back. Uh, with more states contracting for both physical and mental health services in a unified contract with the thinking that this will remove some of those unintended siloed consequences and promote better clinical integration of care. Uh, these are by no means all of the states that are engaged in this, but certainly Arizona, Florida, and Washington are a few outstanding examples, um, but there are many other states that are moving in the direction of uh, contracting for an integrated package of services as a way to get at a more comprehensive integrated service array for people, regardless of where they, where they seek care. 
States have also taken advantage of Medicaid 1115 waivers and uh, sort of a more specialized waiver known as delivery system reform incentive payments um, to reorient their systems of care to have a more integrated approach and capacity. So in states like New Hampshire and New York, we are seeing um, significant investments in primary care and things like care coordination and other supports that can help primary care um, be more able to address the mental health needs of their Medicaid populations and be able to link them more effectively to the services that they may need. So these, um, New York and New Hampshire, uh, as well as other states, are piloting things like incentive payments and quality improvement initiatives and other strategies that can help move the needle on mental health outcomes and mental health access. The state uh, innovation model program, uh, a significant federal initiative, has seen similar investments by states. In SIM, there were two rounds of states, two, two rounds of states were awarded a, a pretty significant amount of funding for three-year pilots. And looking across these states, I would say a majority of them, uh, of the states, the state initiatives funded, funded under this program have integrating behavioral health as uh, at least uh, a component, if not a focus. And SIM states are using those funding, those funds for things like provider training, a lot of development of capacity at the pro provider level in screening and treatment and care coordination. Um, states are using tools like peer-to-peer -peer teleconsulting, um, the ECHO model, uh, creating integrated data analytics for providers that may not have access to them, and other, other supports with a goal of improving that integration at the primary care level. Health homes are another somewhat newish uh, Medicaid option that many states have, have embraced that also allow states to provide a more comprehensive package of care. So this model, the health home model, supports team-based care and can serve almost as a wraparound set of services for a primary care practice to, again, um, include that care coordination piece, which can be so vital in um, helping an individual manage not only their mental health condition, but uh, any com comorbid conditions. Um, it allows uh, primary care practices, or can allow primary care pra practices to access case management, peer navigators, and other supports to assist people with complex needs in a primary care setting. Um, some of the key policy levers on this slide, um, they're, they're the same as the previous slide. Um, the, the policy levers may be, be the same in some cases, but states are maybe using the policy levers in different ways to get at um, improvements in the specialty mental health care that they deliver through Medicaid. So, for instance, while Medicaid managed care is a common tool, we do see states develop more specialty managed care programs to address um, uh, the physical and behavioral health needs of individuals with more serious mental health conditions. So in states like New York and Arizona, they are developing plans that are integrated plans. They provide both, um, they provide physical health uh, benefits, but also a much more robust set of services to address the needs of people with more serious conditions so that the, they can access both the, um, the range of services in the specialty mental health system, but also have their physical health care integrated. Um, and um, another, a major trend for states right now in terms of behavioral health is the use of 1115 waivers, uh, a Medicaid vehicle, to be able to do significant reforms in substance use treatment. And a number of states have taken advantage of 1115 waivers to be able to waive the requirement or waive the prohibition on using federal payment for IMDs. Um, and this is allowing states to bring in or to be able to incorporate things like residential treatment for SUD into their um, Medicaid service array. And um, a similar opportunity exists for, to use these 1115 waivers to expand the continuum of care for people with serious mental illness as well, although that is, that is more recent and just has not had as much uptake, but it does show some promise in being able to um, have additional flexibility to develop uh, more comprehensive a more comprehensive continuum of care. 
Similarly, states are using STEM as a way to invest in behavioral health, and um, states have also had success using STEM to support the adoption of health information technologies in places like community health centers, which, as I mentioned, have not typically had the opportunity to um, uh, have the resources to develop, um, to implement a health information or an EHR, and um, may not have been able to access federal funding that supported that. So some states have used SIM as a way to build that, build that capacity and also create stronger linkages between community mental health and primary care. And health homes have been um, very popular as a state policy tool to design new models of care, more comprehensive care for people with serious mental illness, similar to um, the health homes that uh, support primary care. States are using health homes as a, another team-based model to provide better, better integrated care for people with serious mental illness and also be able to build in things like peer supports or peer navigators. Uh, these uh, health home models we're finding are increasingly, I would say, um, um, replacing traditional targeted case management services um, as, a, as a, a more flexible approach to provide that kind of service. And finally, um, 1915I state plan amendments are uh, another tool that states have to explore ways to provide more comprehensive community supports to individuals with serious mental illness. The, um, the appeal of the 1959 option is, again, um, states are always looking for flexibility to be able to address the needs that are particular to their states. And the 1915 option can help states get at some of the social determinants of health that really disproportionately affect people with mental illness. So through these amendments, they can fund things like housing and employment supports that can assist people in ways that um, go beyond medical care and medical treatment and um, can ultimately support recovery and support uh, the ability of people to maintain a life in their community.